spreading through the bush to start feeding. I have a genre on camera. My name is Brent Leo Smith, and I'm back from leave. Uh, we have uh, Jamie and Dangerous Dave out on the other vehicle, and we have uh, who have we got in final control? Kirsten and Geraldine. And we also got some very special guests join us on this safari. We've got two schools from Virginia and our English class and our biology class. So we're going to be mixing up a bit of English and a bit of biology for tonight's sunset safari for the first hour or so. And I think let's start with an English. So to the English class, I've got a very nice English question for you. Since we are driving past this beautifully large herd of elephants, uh, who can tell me what the original English colloquial collective noun is for a group of elephants? We often refer to them as herds now, but there was a wonderfully pompous old colonial uh, name for them. And if any of you have ever read Rudyard Kipling, he use, utilizes that collective noun to great effect in some of his short stories and books. But we're going to stop with this little section of the herd here. Hello, guys. And remember, if you want to send your answers through to that, it's questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live. Okay, so we just keep very still when the Ellie's come close to us like this. Normally just go around us like they are here. Now an elephant for the biology students out there is quite an interesting animal because it's big and it's dark and big and dark things aren't supposed to do too well in the heat. Yet it's one of the only animals that we'll find moving around in absolute, on absolutely scorching days like today. It's 37 degrees Celsius, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason they are able to do that is they have a magnificent air conditioning system. And we can see there those large ears. And we'll wait till she flaps it. You'll be able to see the large network of veins and arteries in her ear. So what happens, the blood is pumped from the rest of the body into those ears. And then she flaps them. It cools the blood. And, and sends it through to the rest of the body. And that's one of the ways elephants have adapted to deal with the heat like we experience at this very moment. Okay, so the herd's moving through, and this is not uncommon. After they've had a drink, they spread out, uh, when they move towards a water hole, they're often in quite tight formation heading through. But now they'll probably spread out over an area of about three or four football fields and feeding in different little family nucleus groups. And on the edge, you'll often find young bulls because they're quite boisterous, especially the teenagers, uh, especially because they're full of testosterone. They tend to cause a bit of trouble with the females. Uh, who've got young young babies, so they tend to keep those young bulls right on the edge. And speaking of two of the terrible troublemakers that are on the peripheries, there's two of them on their way in now. So they would have hung around for a little bit more fun at the water hole for a little bit longer. And now they'll just hang around on the edge feeding. Uh, we're going to leave those little boys, and we've got a question from Tyree who's wondering if uh, that big female who was very close to us was pregnant. It looked like she had a big belly. She wasn't. She actually had a little baby with her that was probably just over a year old. Uh, you could see her, her, her mammary glands or her teats were highly enlarged, and so she's lactating, producing milk. Uh, not pregnant. She's already had the baby. And elephants actually have the longest gestation period out of any mammal, and it's 22 months. Uh, imagine that. Uh, they have to carry around that baby uh, for an incredibly long time. And just think how big those babies are when they're born, even though they look quite cute. Oh, there's a little one. That one's probably, again, just over a year as it disappears off into the thorn thicket there. Maybe closer to two years, that one. But they have to carry around that incredible weight 
And even a, a, a newborn baby elephant probably weighs more than most of you do at home. And here are the little boys. They're slowly moving through. So here we go, this young, one of the young boys is heading towards the thickets where we just saw that baby disappear. disappear. And there's another young boy off to the left here who's a little bit young. He should be staying a bit closer to mom. And he's going to come into, sh into frame shortly. There we go. So that's a young bull. And he's more than likely... I would guess around eight or nine years old. So not one of the terrible teens, a little bit too young to be hanging too far from the rest of the herd. And if he got abandoned or confused and left behind, he is sort of a size a Pride of Lions might think about taking on in this area. Very unusual behavior, that. Now, Miss Singer has asked a question regarding the Ellie's ears. And I'm not quite sure. I assume she means where you can see on the front side of the ear, there's a sort of roll in there, and that's the, actually their ear. You can see that hole there. So actually, it's just that top area that sort of folds over. And she's wondering why that is. Well, you'll probably find the, the, the cartilage is just not as strong there. Uh, and you, you can also see there are some quite nice large um, veins in that area, and they probably flow just under there. And I don't think there's any particular evolutionary adaptation for that little rollover. An elephant's ear is made up of a, a layer of cartilage, and I just think on the edges, it, it's not as strong, and it folds over. Uh, obviously, it doesn't happen on the bottom, because the bottom is already facing downwards. So it's just, I think, the edge of the cartilage not being as strong as the center. Yes, we're talking about you, mister. Oh, Bailey's wondering why I called those young bulls troublemakers. Well, Bailey, the main reason is that they've got a lot of testosterone um, and androgen. I'll just watch behind you there, Jean-Dre. He's coming to give you a look. So he's just watching Jean-Dre on the camera. OK, he's going to walk past now. Um, so they have got a lot of testosterone. So an elephant bull probably reaches sexual maturity at between 12 and 14 years old. He's unable to mate till he's about 30, though. So there's a lot of sort of confused feelings, let's put it that way. And so they tend to be quite boisterous and, and run in and charge. And of course, when you've got small babies around, sometimes they might just sort of get in the way. I think more than anything else, they just really irritate the adult females. So they tend to push them towards the peripheries of the herd. But they're not quite brave enough to go off by themselves yet, very much like a human child. We'd rather stay closer to mom for as long as possible, even though mom is probably up to here with all of them. But let's move on. Those endies are going to disappear. So while we try to catch up with this elephant herd, uh, let's uh, jump on board with uh, Jamie, who's got a grey beast of a much smaller variety. And good afternoon, everyone, and especially warm good afternoon to these lovely warthogs that have spent the day in the waterhole and across to the buffalo bull that is guarding his spot closely and fiercely in this little pan. And on a hot, boiling hot day in Africa, the waterhole is apparently the place to be. Brent was with the Ellies at the one. I've got some buffalo and a lovely warthog family at the other. Look at them having a little scuffle there. pigs dashing around. So you were with Brent and you were chatting a little bit and I'll say a warm welcome to the students of Lansdowne as well as Green Run. I hope that you're enjoying your safari experience so far. I hear that some of you have been studying African folk tales. 
And I just thought I'd chat a little bit about the warthog. And there's two wonderful ones that I want to share with you while we watch them. You can watch them crouching down on their knees. So the first one is a story that lo hails from a local Zulu culture about why it is that the warthogs eat on their knees or feed on their knees. And the story goes that the warthog was once a handsome creature that was very friendly and very charismatic. And he happened to make friends with the lion, with the lion's wife, the lioness. And this friendship persisted for many months in secret until the lion found out and was furious, at which point the warthog desperately bowed down in supplication to the lion, the great lion, saying, please don't eat me. And that's why now they continually go about on their knees. For those of you interested, I'm going to put it to you as a question as to why, in fact, they feed on their knees. What advantage might that give them? And hello, by the way, my name is Jamie. I also have Dave on camera with me just to let you all, fill you all in on our whole system and setup. We sit with a cameraman on the back and he brings you all of the action. So back to our little warthog family before they do decide to disappear. You can see they've all been wallowing in the mud. I'm sure Brent has commented on just how hot it is this afternoon. Oh, you can see where the mud mollows marks are. Now that is the way that we, that the animals get away or get cool on a hot afternoon like this afternoon. And Keegan and Caesar were both wondering a little bit from a personal level, how do we deal with the heat? And the answer is we're all, it's amazing how adaptable human beings as a species are. Most of us have grown up in this kind of weather and in this kind of climate. These kinds of days, yes, we all feel exceptionally warm. And yes, we do. I mean, I'm sweating at the moment. As human beings, we sweat naturally. I'm used to this climate. I lived in the UK for three years and I absolutely froze for three years and I was still wearing jerseys and jumpers on days when my friends were walking around in t-shirts. So it's, your body adapts and decides how it's going to approach the situations or the temperature situations that we deal with. We also have water sprayers. Sleeping at night is always the tricky one. So what you do is you wrap yourself in a wet towel or a wet kukoi, whatever you happen to find. And that is your general approach to cooling down. We're also incredibly fortunate in that we have a swimming pool. I'm not sure whether Brent mentioned, but an elephant just before we started to go live, an elephant made its way back into the garden and appeared to be thinking very carefully about having a drink at our swimming pool. So definitely a wild life that we live. Are the little piglets all wandering through? And I just wanted to show you something around their faces. Something that I always find incredibly interesting about warthogs. Those little tufts of white hair around their cheek. You see, they're not at the mature stage yet where they have developed their tusks. You can see the tusks just starting to poke through. Like elephants, those are modified incisor teeth that are growing. And the tufts of white fur along the cheeks are actually meant to imitate fully grown tusks as a way of making them seem slightly more threatening for any predators. Now this family originally, there's two females with four piglets. Originally, there were six of them when we first started seeing them in this area. There's now four of them. I, th I know of at least one that was taken by a leopard because we happened to see him eating the warthog piglet. I'm not sure where the other one went, but it probably has also succumbed to the possibility of a leopard attack. They are definitely on the leopard's menu of favorite food. And as our warthog, I know Brent was talking about collective nouns for elephants, as our warthog sounder moves off into the bush, let's jump back onto Brent's vehicle and find out what he's found. So we're just getting in position with these Ellie's again. And I've got a lovely little one here. It's a year old. Looks like a little boy. And 
you can see he's sort of mo mastered the use of his trunk already, not quite to the degrees of an adult. And it takes the little Eddies a couple of months to really get the hang of it. And you see very young ones don't really know what they're doing. They're unable to pick a little leaflet like he's doing at the moment. But we are experiencing the worst drought in South Africa uh, since 91, uh, 90, 1991 and 1992. Now, um, a lot of people consider this a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And I was going to ask Andre to go a little bit wider. You can actually see how the elephants are really opening up the bush. Now, on a very short term, this is beneficial to quite a lot of other animals. They bring down food that a lot of other animals wouldn't have been able to reach. On the long term, it's going to remove a lot of the, the smaller shrubs and, and bushes that have been growing for the last 10 or 15 years. We've had a very wet 10 or 15 years. Now, what happens is these bush encroach on the grass, and grass is actually far more important to a lot of animal species than, than, than trees are. And once we do end this drought, a lot of these smaller brush brushes and shrubs will have been removed and will actually make more space for grass to grow, which will actually help increase animal populations. And this is one of those wonderful ways nature works so well. And drought is, is nature's way of controlling certain animal species uh, as well, particularly your, your bigger, bigger species. So animals that generally get really hit hard by drought is are, are elephants, buffalo, Rhino, uh, to a lesser degree, wildebeest, zebra. Oh, look at him. Really enjoying that little sickle bush. And that, in a really, really wet year, is something an elephant wouldn't feed on. So Naya is wondering, are the elephants safe from being attacked, both by human beings and natural predators? Well, as animals go, you're about as safe as you can be being an elephant uh, from natural predators. Uh, in this part of the world, it's very unusual for lions to hunt elephants. But if they happen to come on a situation like this, a little baby elephant who's now not too far, but 100 or so feet away from the other adults, they might think about it, uh, but in a drought situation like this, they've got so much food, the lions do, that it's unlikely that they would attempt a risky thing. But as soon as that elephant screams, the rest of the herd will come to its aid, and a lion does not want to tag with an adult female elephant. And from a human point of view, where we are now, they're actually very, very safe from any form of, form of, of attack, and we have very little elephant poaching. Uh, in South Africa as a whole. Uh, other parts of Africa, elephants are under threat, but in South Africa, the population is actually growing, uh, actually to a point where certain, certain national parks, they're beginning to worry that we've got too many elephants, which is bad for the ecosystem in whole. Uh, Lauren is wondering, are the elephant and warthog tusks bones? They are not. They are a tooth. So uh, they're a modified incisor, if I remember correctly. Uh, so it's a teeth, so it's enamel. It's the same as any other tooth. So the uh, are moving off here. We're going to try to see if we can reposition again shortly. This little guy is about to wander off to join Mom. There he goes. Oh, he suddenly realized how far Mom got away. <laughs> he got a fright. Where's my mother? We might hear a little trumpet. I thought he might have a little complaint to mom when he caught up. Let's go have a look at what else these ladies are up to. Hello, little man. Uh, young bull over here. Is he tearing up a bush willow? And Anthony, welcome on the safari today, Anthony. Anthony would like to know, when is the breeding season for elephants and warthogs? 
Well, elephants don't have a particular breeding season. They can breed throughout the year. Uh, warthogs, however, do. Uh, uh, they will always give birth in sort of December, January. Oh, the wind's just picked up. And there was some storm clouds around, so maybe we'll get a bit of rain later. But it would be very, very welcome. So the warthogs have a gestation period of about seven months. So my maths is horrific, but if I go back from November, so probably, uh, actually, Mar March, April would be breeding season for warthogs once those little piglets have got a bit bigger. No, sorry, I lie. June would be breeding season for the warthogs. So we're going to move on, see if we can catch up with the rest of the herd. Uh, while we do that, uh, we're going to jump back on board with Jamie, who's got a trafalegid antelope for you. And when we get back, we'll do an African folk story on elephants. Just sneaking up really quietly. I don't want to startle the little one. We've got a baby kudu walking straight across the road in front of us. Wonderful, graceful little antelope. And in a moment, when it comes through, it should actually join the mother. It's a little bit off to our right. Even behind there. Just to give you an idea of just how tiny and new these little ones are. And since I have found some kudu, I just have to tell you, I think my favorite, hands down, folk, stores, folk story about kudu and their cousins in Yala, this little one looking at us with radar ears, it's hiding in the bushes there. So the story goes, and this was actually shared by one of our viewers, a lady named Teresa. And she actually told us the story of how the idea was, or the local legend goes, that Kudu's legs were too skinny to hold them upright. And so the creator reached down and picked them up. And wherever there is white on a Kudu or their cousins in Yala, that is where they were touched by the creator. There you go, there's mom. Or at least one of their mothers. An animal perfectly adapted for hiding away in thick vegetation, just like this. Large ears to amplify every sound that they hear. And very, very good eyesight. Eyes positioned on the side of their head to take in as much of their surroundings as possible. And watch how when they walk, even at a young age, very often they walk with their ears backwards so that they can hear whatever is hiding or whatever might be sneaking up behind them. Definitely one of my favorite antelope species. I'm gonna see if I can get you one more view of them, just because those little ones are terribly sweet. And while I try and shift back to see if we can get a view, I don't think we're going to, in which case I'll move forward towards the giraffe. Shay was wondering, when did I start having a passion for wildlife? I'm just going to turn my radio down. Sorry, Shay. Shay, the answer is I don't even remember when I started my passion for wildlife. I think it was probably my earliest memory is of being in the Kruger National Park with my grandfather. And apparently I was about two years old at the time. And I remember sitting on a big bridge, one of those bridges that you can actually get out on. And a, I remember a lion walking past the window. I remember being so phenomenally excited about this. It was just the most incredible thing to two-year-old me, and I remember thinking that that was very, very big. And it, it carried on from there. I'd been on quite a few family holidays to the bush. My grandfather used to be a game warden, so he, at one point in his life, he did sort of run and organize reserves in the area. This is one of his favorite places in the country. So even though I grew up in Johannesburg, which is one of our biggest cities, definitely our highest populated city, 
the love of wildlife and the thrill of wildlife has been with me from a very early age. And I'm very, it is a very lucky thing in life. It is a very fortunate thing in life to be able to do something that you love in the same way that we get to do. I never wake up in the morning and dread having to get up and go to work. Always something that comes with the excitement of a new day. And there's not, not everyone gets to say that in their life, so I'm very aware of how grateful I should be for that. Okay, try and get you a view of these giraffes. There's some giraffe there, quite far away. I can actually loop around to get closer, but I'll just show you where I mean. So got a huge herd of impala. There's the giraffe all the way over there. You see his head sticking up. Munching away. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you across so you can jump on the back of Brent's vehicle and I'm going to loop around and get a bit closer to this giraffe for you. So, well, I said I would tell you an African folklore when I got back, and it's a particularly pertinent one since we have seen both warthog and elephant on the, this sunset safari. Warthogs with Jamie and elephant with us still. Uh, it is called the Kindly Art Fark. Now, I know we're talking about elephants and warthogs, and I'm throwing an art fark into the mix. So, it's a Kikuyu story, so it's not actually from South Africa, it's from well north of us in East Africa. Uh, the Kikuyu live mostly in Kenya. And in the old days, Warthog and Artfark were best friends. And they used to spend a lot of time chatting. And Artfark inadvertently heard how elephant coveted Warthog's tusks. And in those days, elephant had the smallest tusks and Warthog had a massive beautiful pair of tusks and even though uh, they were quite difficult for warthog to move around with he was incredibly proud now warthog was a bit of a is a bit of a forgetful animal so artfark warned warthog that the elephant was after its tusks and some weeks went past and warthog was happily grazing away and he came across the elephant the elephant was being very nice and warthog was very sort of in awe well, let's have a quick look while these eddies are going to disappear into a thick drainage line. Uh, a drainage line is a sort of creek bed, a dry creek bed, and very thick, so we're not going to follow them in there. Here we go. So, Warthog had forgotten that Art Fark had warned him that Elephant was after his tusks. So, after all the flattery that Elephant had bestowed upon Warthog, uh, spending the whole day even helping Warthog dig out some luscious tubers and roots. Elephant then said, well, your, your, your tusks are so magnificent, could I just try them for a very, very short time and I'll, I'll give them straight back. And Warthog, being the kindly soul that it is, happily did so. And uh, as soon as Elephant had placed those tusks into its face, it went and looked at itself in the water hole and thought, my goodness, don't I look just smashing? Uh, and then went back and beat Warthog when he tried to ask for his tusks back. So Warthog dejectedly put Elephant's little tusks into his, into his mouth and he went home with his tail between his legs. Oh, we've got some more elephants coming to join the others. Oh, isn't that nice? And on, on Warthog, on his way home, he met Artfark and told Artfark the sad story and bemoaned the fact that couldn't remember Art Fark's warning about Warthog trying to get those tusks. Nice camera work, jean -Dre sticking on the tusks. And Art Fark said, don't worry, my friend. From now on, you will always have a home to hide in from hunters. An elephant will have to move across the savannah, and people will covet those tusks, and you shall be safe. And you can live in a burrow underground. And Warthog said, but how is that so, Art Fark? I am not a great digger. And Art Fark said, don't worry, I dig so many holes and they're all over the place and I'm always making new ones that you are welcome to sh you live in any hole that I have made. And since that day, Art Fark and Warthog remain very good friends 
and all live in the same burrows, while Elephant has to wander without a home and protect his tusks from the others who covered them. And it's a nice little Kikuyu folklore from East Africa. So those Ellies are moving down. I think there might be a few more left up here. Uh, we're going to see if we can move around towards them. And while we do that, uh, for the English class out there, we've just done a folklore. And now we'll do a few more collective nouns, since no one has answered the elephant collective noun yet. But we're going to go across to Jamie, who's got a dazzle and a journey. we go. I set off to find giraffe and I happen to come across some zebra as well. So two for one in this particular deal because just to their left is Africa and the world's tallest animal at five odd meters which puts it well over 15 feet. And there you go. We've got a dazzle of zebra and one part, one sad little part of a journey. There is actually a second giraffe here, but she hasn't decided to make her way into view just yet. And I say her, it is a female, quite a dark in color female. Her on the, on the top of her ossicones, the horns on top of her head. You can see that tongue that she's sticking out there to wrap around the leaves is incredibly dexterous and versatile and can reach up to half a meter in length so about one and a half feet that tongue can extend to i've seen them pick their noses with it even it's a great way of reaching and catching leaves that are harder to reach but interestingly enough that long neck according to what most evolutionary biologists are now arguing is not an advantage in terms of reaching up for the higher leaves. It's actually evolved as a fighting mechanism amongst males, a way of competing with each other for access to the females. And the females just happen to have them as a part of the, part of the, the, the sort of the natural evolutionary process. The longer the neck, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen videos of giraffe fighting, but they swing their heads at each other and hit each other on the sides and the rump and the legs. You can imagine the momentum of a 12 kilogram skull, which for you students is close over 25 pounds worth of head on the end of a two meter neck, it makes for an incredibly powerful force. So for years, I know certainly I was raised into believing that a long, a giraffe's long neck was a way of, was an evolutionary design. I'm just gonna move forward for the sec to catch the second giraffe moving in. It was a way of the giraffe being able to reach up to the higher trees. And it's only now that we're starting to realize that this isn't the case. Here we go, we can turn nice and clearly. Much lighter in color. So, hey, hey, young Kim, you were wondering about the purpose that the horns serve in a giraffe, and you suggest you were wondering, does it is it determined by their sex? Is it part of camouflage, or is it for fighting? And here's a female with very, very thin ossicones with the tufts of hair on top of them. Now, there's actually what looks like a male behind her as well, which makes for a really nice comparison. And the answer to your question there she is at the back there. So the top of a male's ossicones are rubbed bald. They have hardly any tufts of hair and they're probably about double the width or double the radius of that of a, gira a female giraffe, which tells us almost immediately, hello girl, that they very much are used as a fighting tool and females very seldom use them as any way of protecting themselves or their offspring. Instead, they kick at any kind of threat like a lion or a leopard that might decide to challenge them. But for males, those horns on the top of their head, and they're not true horns, because although they are bone, they are not covered in a keratin sheath, which is why I keep calling them ossicones. It's the official name for them. Males, they are much wider, much thicker, 
And they, as I said, mentioned earlier, during a process known as necking, they will fight each other and swing their heads with their ossicones on them. If you look at it, it's one of the differences between males and females, apart from the width of those ossicones. The males also have very dominant, predominant lumps on the tops of their skulls and behind the ossicones, so just behind at the base of the skull, so that no matter what angle their head connects with as they swing it round and hit each other with, it will still cause some damage. And they can seriously injure each other. And what I would suggest you do if you're interested in it is go and have a look at videos of them fighting, possibly even in slow motion. There are a couple of them out there. And just have a look at the impact that they hit each other with. And then you start to understand how biologists have come to that conclusion that it's actually, rather than a feeding tool to help them compete for higher access to food, might actually be a reproductive tool, a competitive and reproductive tool. It's the same explanation offered for those, for, um, for the dinosaurs with long necks. So Diplodocus and Black Brachiosaurus, scientists are beginning to equate the two. And it's one of those interesting things because no matter how much we learn about the area that we're in, we're still not going to know everything. And I'm coming up to the zebra to give you a sort of point in an example. And stripes have always believed to have been entirely camouflage driven. And yes, to a certain extent, as we look through the bushes, as the zebra moves through, you can see that it works. You can see it could act to disrupt the vision of a predator, even at this distance. Have you spotted the zebra yet? Yep, there he is. But now people are starting to think about the theories behind either thermoregulation, so hot stripes, the black stripes heating up and the white stripes not heating up as much and creating microcurrents, or the dominant theory is that it interferes with the landing proprioception of flies like tsetse flies that would land on them and possibly pass on a disease like sleeping sickness. But the truth is, Nobody knows and nobody actually agrees on what zebra stripes are for. One of, those, one of the things I love the most about here is that everything is a mystery. A very he big hello to the Lansdowne School Division Central Office and Dr. Matney. A warm welcome to our safari this afternoon. I'm glad that the animals decided to cooperate. It's always touch and go on a hot afternoon like this afternoon, but they never fail to stun us and surprise us and make a, an appearance. I'm glad that they did, and I'm also mostly glad that the rain that's been threatening all day is held off for now. We need it, of course, and it is coming, but I'm glad that it could hold off for the 45 minutes we needed it to. Just try and give you a nice perspective of both the giraffe and the zebra. chatted a bit about giraffe fighting each other and China in Virginia who was was wondering if I've ever seen giraffe fight and why would they do that and the answer is yes I have I've seen it many times most of the time it's been a fairly playful sparring between two young males but I have seen serious competition between large males and that only really happens when there's a female that is in estrus so she's ready to mate and bear offspring. And the reason they fight for her is because their main mission, or one of their main missions in life, most organisms in fact, is to reproduce, so to continue the species. I'm just gonna try and see, since they've vanished behind the trees, if there is a male still visible. It's drive as I answer this question and just see if he's gonna pop his head out. So every species on Earth's goal is to reproduce. And the same goes for giraffe or zebra or anything like that. And a lot of the time the males compete for the access to females, the access and the right to mate. Some animals have territories and that's how 
they keep their mating rights by keeping a territory that will attract a female and allow him to have sole access to that female. But in the case of giraffe, they don't have territories. So if two males come upon a female together, then they fight it out to see who gets to mate with her. And a lot of the time, that, that can be a process over a couple of days. So they need to keep up that performance. But what that means for the female is that her offspring is getting the best genetic range possible as a father. So he's proved himself. Where did this male giraffe go? Surely I cannot lose a 900 kilogram giraffe. I'm sure he was here, Dave. I wasn't imagining him. So fighting means that from a biological perspective, the strongest individual gets to pass on the strongest possible genes. And it's one of the reasons why, although this drought is going to be heartbreaking, and we are in the middle of a very serious drought, I really did, I really did lose a 900 kilogram giraffe. That is, that's quite impressive. He must have snuck past me. <laughs> Where did you go, buddy? No, nope. he's vanished. Now the giraffe females that we saw were mature cows. Emily was wondering how, lo how long can a giraffe live? How old will they live to be? And Emily, the answer is generally around 20 or so. They can live a bit longer in captivity and it depends on the circumstances. Some of them, like that male, have this magical powers of invisibility or something because he's completely vanished. He must have cut around us. Ah, but since we're here, here's a fun animal for us to look at. So Emily, an age range of about 15 to 20, some longer than others. But I want to stop and show you these birds. Because I promise you, you'll never look at Jurassic Park the same way again. As you all know, dinosaurs are considered to have then, or birds, sorry, are considered to have evolved pretty much straight from the dinosaur line. Watch the way these guinea fowl move and see if it reminds you of anything. Because the creators of Jurassic Park and those responsible for the CGI and the effects of the dinosaurs, they based the way that the Tyrannosaurus rex and the Velociraptors run and walk on guinea fowl. And in fact, they used a lot of the vocal ranges from African birds as well. So the screeching came from vultures, as well as the deep rumbling sounds of elephants. Fascinatingly colored little bird. As they wander off across the clearing, I'm going to say goodbye to all of the students of Lansdowne and Green Run. It's been wonderful having you on board. I do hope that you have enjoyed every moment of it. And for your last few minutes, I'm going to send you back onto the vehicle with Brent, and I hope to see you again in the future. Cheers, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Welcome back. And uh, we've got a lovely question from Princess. Hi, Princess. Uh, Princess would like to know another folk story and what's my favorite one? Princess, that is a very difficult question. I have many favorite folklores from Africa, from all different parts of Africa. Uh, I think possibly we might have time for two. One of my favorites is actually more of a folk joke than a folk lore. Uh, and it's from the Mbugush, the river bushmen that are up in northern Botswana, uh, through to uh, northern Namibia into southern Angola. And it's about the hippopotamus. And if you, I don't know if any of you have ever heard a hippo and what noise it makes. He sort of sits there and goes, mm, ah, 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 ah. So what the Mbogush say, you never know whether the hippo is the best joker in the bush or the worst joker in the bush, because they make that noise as soon as they come up, often from being under the water. So they, they say they tell each other the joke under the water, and when they come up, they laugh. Mm, oh, oh, oh. But you never know if they're laughing because the joke is so funny. Or well, they're laughing at you because you don't know the joke. I think that's one of my favorites. It's more of a fun one than a serious one. Most of the African folklores and stuff do have a, a moral to the story. 
So I think we'll do that one as last, and it's about the the greedy hunter. And that is a Zulu folklore, uh, and I grew up quite a bit in northern Zululand, and basically there was a very lazy hunter who saw a female cheetah with three cubs, and she had killed an impala, and he was watching from the bushes, and he saw what a good hunter the cheetah was. So when mom went off to go get a drink, he stole the cubs, and eventually the cheetah cried so much, she gets those black tear marks down her face. Uh, and one of the Zulu elders asked the cheetah, Cheetah, why are you crying so much? And it was because she'd lost her cubs, and then eventually they figured out it was, the, it was the naughty hunter, the lazy hunter, who had stolen her cubs, causing a cheetah to get its tear, tear marks. And the moral of the story is that hunter was then banished, and it was to never be greedy. That's always a good one to remember. And on that note, it's been great having you guys with us. I hope you learned something. And if you didn't, I hope you at least had a little bit of fun. Otherwise, hopefully we'll see you quite soon. And we're going to continue on. Hopefully, Jandre has already been pestering me to try find some lions and leopards on my first drive back. So that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, as I said, Jandre has been pestering me uh, to find some lions and leopards and of course I would love to because it's International Women's Day and it wouldn't it be footing, uh, fitting if we found one of our sleek female cats of the bush for the day. So I'm going to have a quick gander around the western sector, see if I can find any tracks of Madame Shadow, who I haven't seen in an age so I always love to catch up with the leopards if I haven't seen them in a while. Interesting. We had such big cloud buildup just before we went live. We actually even got a few spatterings of rain. We got a little bit worried, uh, but well, for the drive. But hopefully, we do get rain after drive tonight. There are some massive cumulus clouds building all around in the sky. I'll try to get to some high ground to show you. But unfortunately, the area where our weather normally comes from, which is the west, is not looking so productive. There's a couple of little clouds but nothing big. Everything seems to be further north and further east of us at the moment. But uh, during my leave, we did, I did quite a bit of traveling and to the east of us could definitely use rain, definitely more than we can. They've had less rain than we have uh, in the Kruger National Park. Now, there's been quite a lot of debate. Uh, recently, Kruger closed a lot of water holes. And the reason is this, because they were man-made water holes and they have actually to a degree changed animal behavior. And recently they have now agreed to open certain water holes. These water holes are not man-made water holes. They're not sinking boreholes again. What they're doing is they're going to the perennial rivers, uh, the large sand rivers, uh, such as uh, the oh, Wensensutu, and um, Winston Soto, and a lot of those are on the central area of the park. Now, the Eddies are still managing to dig up water there, and there is quite a lot of water just below the surface. This is the first year of the drought, so that the water table hasn't been that adversely affected yet. Uh, so what they're doing is they're actually digging water holes where there is actually naturally occurring underground water uh, that would have been dug up by elephants, but obviously just on a bit of a bigger scale. Now that of course will help with the water, but grazing is also a huge problem. And a lot of you who watch a lot of the Kruger Park sightings, boards and all that stuff, uh, there's quite a lot of misinformation flying around on those things about drought and, and whatnot, because um, I met someone in, a, in Hood Spread recently, who just been through the park and apparently all the buffaloes are dead. Uh, but while I was in the park, I saw a herd of over a thousand looking quite happy and healthy up in the north. So, very interesting sort of a little bit of stats to give you an idea uh, why drought is not always the worst thing. So I've spoken about that, that drought in 91, 92 uh, being the worst in the last sort of 50 years. Uh, the, at that time, the Kruger Buffalo population was around 30, 30, 35,000. Uh, and at the end of that drought, they were down to 12,000. So obviously a mass die off. 
uh, and that double styles on the left were of the most supreme genetic stock, uh, the biggest, the fittest, the strongest. Uh, now, since 1990, end of 92, the end of the drought, uh, through to now, the, the park's buffalo population has done even better. So they're around 48,000 now, uh, and in similar conditions in 91, already sort of 10, or, or not sorry, like 10, five or 6,000 had already died by this stage. Uh, and we're looking at only 1,000 now. So on average, those, those strong genetics have won through. And we probably are gonna use a few thousand buffalo if this uh, drought continues. But we must also remember we're gonna gain quite a few lions and, and, and hyenas and other predators, because the predators numbers will come up. Uh, and we must remember drought is natural uh, as much as it is very difficult and and if you're in a bush and in an open ecosystem like we are with 3.9 million hectares uh, over 8 million acres uh, of unfenced wilderness that those numbers that might seem quite catastrophic on the on the small scale are not that bad if you're talking about the meta population or the whole population and the health of the ecosystem as a whole so the other thing is the elephants will be clearing out a lot of these small shrubs and bushes as they get more desperate for food. And when we do get rain, that'll increase that area's grass capacity, which will help those animals bounce back much quicker once the drought is over. But of course, uh, there's a lot of different things and lots of people saying things on social media about this at the moment. Uh, you, you must understand also that Kruger is the most probably the most well-researched and run park in Africa. So I think we should let the Kruger scientists uh, do their job. And I think that Kruger has got it very well under control at the moment. So unfortunately, no sign of any leopard tracks. So a nice hot and sweaty 98 degree Fahrenheit safari live welcome to Jennifer in Missouri. I'm sure it's definitely not that warm where you are, Jennifer. Uh, and Jennifer says in, in lieu of International Women's Day and the search for the feline ladies of Juma, have I heard any updates about Queen Karula and her two bundles of joy? Uh, as far as I know, they were seen this morning to the property to the south of us. Uh, and she's, as from what I know, keeping them uh, in a drain pipe under the busiest road in the Sabi Sands. Uh, or she was. I don't know if she is anymore. But that is the last update. And both youngsters were looking fit and healthy. So that's really, really great news. continue to peruse the central sections of Juma Private Game Reserve, let's go see what the wonderful Jamie is up to. We are off on a search, in theory, to see if we can follow up on those wild dogs that were seen admittedly far away, but there's always that chance, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, that they've decided to head across in this direction. They were seen at three in a row pan on Cheetah Plains, so it's a little bit of a distance away, but we can be ever hopeful. My goodness, warthogs. I was going to stop and show you the family of warthog, but they're demonstrating their usual behavior, which we haven't seen as much of in the last few weeks. They've definitely been calming down a bit around vehicles, but it's just a cloud of dust. They have raced away. Now the wind is howling this afternoon, ringing with it serious promises, actual promise of rain. I'm so excited. I think we all are on this blistering hot day. And it really is warm. It's got a very muggy feeling in the air. And I've worked out as well why I think this summer has felt so incredible, so much hotter 
than the previous ones I've experienced in this area. And it's the fact that there's never, usually in midsummer, there's this build of tension. And yes, it's really hot during the day, but there's always that promise of a thunderstorm and it breaks that temperature cycle and it just gets so much cooler straight away in the evenings. You don't have this constant level, high level of heat for days on end and then the dry wind blowing at you. And the promise of a storm, okay, admittedly the sun is very much out at the moment, but the promise of a storm is a very exciting one. Apparently the entire country is going to be experiencing rain right across the board. I'm thrilled, I'm really excited about that. On this International Women's Day, it's wonderful that we started off the day with the elephants, the matriarchy of the herd, but my plan is most definitely, and I have to do it on International Women's Day, to visit the only true matriarchal system in certainly our ecosystem, and probably most of the animal kingdom, and that is to, of course, go across to the hyena den. That will be planned for a little later when it's a bit cooler. Hopefully the weather holds off. And speaking about matriarchies, Debbie, who is watching in Vancouver, was wondering what are the benefits to having a matriarchal system versus the other way around. So the normal, the, the sort of the normal approach for most, most animals, for example, antelope species, it's very much male dominated. If you look at the impala, for example, the males are much larger, they dominate the females. But it's a very different social structure. Debbie, that's a really good point. Let's see, we see it mainly in elephants and spotted hyenas in this particular ecosystem. I've got a suggestion, and that is for elephants in particular. Generally, females of a species tend to live a little bit males, and that's because the males very often compete for the attention of the females. They can kill each other, but also just in general physically. We know this is the case research that human women have a longer lifespan in general and are slightly more physically capable of de dealing with things like diseases in a way. We also have a higher pain, higher pain tolerance. That's a physical, a biological aspect to it. And I suppose having your family run by a consistent female that is not distracted by the need to seek out mating opportunities in different regions, but can actually focus her attention on what she's doing which is leading her herd to safety, protecting her herd, plus forming a bond with all of the females within that group. I suppose that has its benefits. And certainly, if you compare elephant calf mortality to that of almost any other young animal, it probably must be one of the lowest of any mammal. Because the elephant calf has got the protection of the herd. That, that I think, would exist. Oh. Let me just go through here, up onto the other side. Just one of those little signal dips. It's that aspect of live television is a natural, natural circumstance. All right, so Debbie, I think that is one aspect. We look at the mortality rate. Look at the mortality rate as well of hyena cubs. It's also lower than that, as far as I know, it's lower than that of any other predator in the early stages of development. And then you've got the big mother theory. So the true matriarchal system, like a hyena system, the females are bigger than the males. And one of the, the theories behind that is because the bigger the female, the better its ability to produce milk. And one way of increasing its size is to plug the females full of testosterone and androgen to work that approach. I'm just going to go a little bit slower here. I'm just looking for that poor female warthog that has not been looking very healthy at all. But she has done the most incredible job, despite the fact that she is so ill, of raising two piglets. And I must say, I'm full of admiration for the way that animals 
handle themselves in such extreme circumstances. She's very, very sick. Bones sticking out. I hope that she makes it. I'm really holding thumbs. Got a lovely shout out on International Women's Day and it comes from Maggie who is in Western Australia and Maggie sent out a shout out for inspirational woman in her life and she mentions her friend JW who overcame cancer and I'm sure that we all feel exactly the same as Maggie that's an incredible achievement and thank you so much Maggie for sending through that story I'm, trying, I'm thinking about inspirational women in my life just to send out my own personal one. And there's been many, but of course I have to say, since it is Women's Day, I have to say a big shout out to my mom, without whom none of the opportunities that I've had in my life would have been possible, and who has played a large role in making me who I am. So a big shout out to my mom, who is my inspirational woman of the day. But please, everybody, all the ladies out there, send, and, and gentlemen, send through your inspirational stories about women that you have met or encountered or have heard about in your lives. Another dip might lose you through here. That seems to be okay. Ducking through the Mulwati drainage line. And speaking of inspirational females, I know that Brent chatted a little bit about Karula, but Shannon was wondering, what about Karula's daughter, Shadow? Shannon, can we hold that thought? I suspect, I strongly suspect that she has cubs somewhere. I don't know where, I'm still waiting to get confirmation from the other guides. I have been in contact with friends of ours who work on Simbambili and Arethusa. And I'm gonna try and clarify for you. She hasn't been seen in a while. And that could well be because she is hiding cubs somewhere. So Shannon, keep our fingers crossed. I'm fairly certain that is the case. And hopefully, in the next few weeks or months, we'll have a chance to see Shadow with her next set of cubs. Shadow, of course, in contrast to Karula, has had some really seriously bad luck when it comes to raising cubs. Whoop, just have a quick drink. Mm. Just while we're here, for those of you who are watching the Sunrise Safari, we were tracking a male lion, and they did find him. They found him on Torchwood, along with two of the other Birmingham boys, so he did go across Cheetah Cut Line and crossed our eastern boundary. He's around. It's interesting how the Birmingham boys really seem to have split into an almost permanent 3-2 coalition. And that doesn't mean that it will stay a permanent split. They will move apart and come together as they go along. But it is pretty much what we predicted they would do once they established themselves in a territory. You hear the wind blowing across us. A little bird I haven't stopped for in a while. One that we take for granted on a fairly, you see them fairly rickety shame, desperately trying to, no, don't, don't go away, birdie. Trying to balance, we've got him there, Dave. It's a fork-tailed drongo. Now we see them so frequently and I think quite often we as presenters forget to stop for them. And they really are attractive little birds, but they're also incredibly intelligent. One of the greatest mimics out here, capable of imitating all kinds of bird calls and have been known to trick even the most experienced of birders into thinking that they are a different bird. And most of you, well, some of you may well know 
the story of the forktail drongos in the Kalahari that have learned to imitate meerkat alarm calls. They do it in times of, dry, of drought or where there's been a lack of food. And they wait until the meerkats go out foraging. And then they give the alarm call and the meerkats drop everything and run because they think it's another meerkat that's spotted a predator. And they dash into their burrows. What's amazing about that is that meerkats have a wide variety of different alarm calls and each one means a different thing. Here he, off he goes. But each alarm call means something different. And the drongo has worked out that the best one to imitate is the one, because some alarm calls mean come here, there's a snake and we need to mob it. And some mean go, to go undercover and some mean run to the burrow. And they've worked out which one means that the meerkats will drop their food immediately and dash off to the safety of their holes. That to me is an incredible display of intelligence. We know that there are intelligent birds out there. Drongo have also been known to imitate cuckoo, cuckoo calls at breeding season. So the time when the cuckoos would be looking to parasitize their nests. Something like, for example, a greater spotted cuckoo parasitizes drongo nests. And what they do is they imitate, because some, some cuckoos can be quite territorial in the region that they work in, they imitate that call as loudly as possible, essentially as a way of sending a, or discouraging any other cuckoo that might be in the area from moving in and moving and laying an egg in their nests and making them hosts of the brood parasite's chick. That also to me is the most incredible approach in the arms race that has developed between cuckoos and their host species. And it's a little bird that we see all the time. Whenever there's an elephant sighting, you can pretty much guarantee that a fork-tailed drongo will be ducking and diving around, catching any insects that might have been stirred up. I'm going to stop here for a moment because we've got a very, very special shout out from eight-year-old Gracie. And eight-year-old Gracie has got a shout out on Happy Princess Day. And she said that she would like to say Happy Princess Day to her mommy, her granny, and to all of the nurses that look after her. And without them, she would be very sad. So definitely one of the most special messages that we have received, Gracie. I think that if I had to name one other inspirational woman, I would definitely list you amongst them. It was a beautiful day. Thank you, Gracie. That was a very special message. I had to stop the car for that. I'm making, uh, I'm gonna take two inspirational women. One is my mom and one is Gracie on Happy Princess Day. And to all of the nurses. Right. Back on to find you amazing things. Marilla tree. I look at it every time I drive past and I think about stopping to chat about it. You just look how it's completely rotted away. Now this has come from probably elephants attacking the bark and that is in turn has led to some kind of disease taking hold of the marula, whether it's from borer beetles and in fact you can actually see if we have a look there in the trunk you can see all of the holes from the borer beetles and the termites eating through into the tree itself. The bark has peeled away. This is an old tree that has finally reached the end of its lifespan. And it's very common with marula trees. They've got 
vastly soft wood in comparison to most of the other tree species. So definitely fairly useless if you ever find yourself in a search for firewood. A maruna tree is not the way that you want to go. It burns very quickly, it takes very quickly, but it doesn't make for the best fire. It burns out very rapidly. Very soft wood. Lovely for, also lovely for a very ornamental wood. It's very pretty. But again, you're going to run the risk of borer beetles coming in very quickly. The other, as other aspect of maruna bark is that it's a really good antihistamine, which I really feel like I need at the moment. Because I walked, I've mentioned this yesterday, I walked through a pepper tick nest, and right now, I, I really, I want to take all of the skin off of the top of my foot. It is so itchy. I can't begin to describe it, and it doesn't happen to everyone. There's a couple of us. I know Steph is one person that also reacts the way I do. I, I cannot find, there's nothing that works. Annie, who's watching in British Columbia, Annie would like to know, as a woman who has worked in regularly in fields that are predominantly male dominated, she would like to know if there are any female animals that exhibit male characteristics apart from, she anticipated my answer there, apart from the spotted hyena's pseudo penis. Annie, I'm going to give that some thought. I'm trying to think there's not that many good examples out here. Yes, there is actually. That's just because I'm thinking too much. Oh, oh that's a pity. There was a gymnogene in the tree, but I just didn't quite spot it. An African harrier hawk. Oh, well, I actually came around the corner to just have a look at this lovely lady waterbuck. Annie, I have thought about something, and that is the African jacana, which is a bird. And rather than the very typical common poly, um, the, the system where males mate with lots of females, also, sorry, I got completely distracted because look who's just come out of the bushes. Look how tiny that is. Right, sorry, so males, most male birds, a little bird species, either are monogamous or they mate with lots of females. But the African jacana mates with lots of different male partners and leaves them to raise the chicks whilst she goes off and lays her next batch. That's quite a good example. Oh, sorry, this is too sweet. Hello, Mom. Have you just come back to your baby? Waterbuck leave their youngsters for hours at a time, hidden in the bushes. She's obviously just come back to find her little calf. Too cute. Not an easy job being an antelope mom. The males don't tend to play much of a role in protecting their offspring. And it's all up to the female. And that means leaving her herd, or the protection or the safety of her herd, to come and look after this one. Having a good wash now. Reaffirming those bonds that are so essential. Important if you're a little waterbuck calf. Hello, are you curious? To make sure that you know your mom when she comes calling. Look, she's going to wander off. Is the calf going to follow her? Is it going to stay here? Yep, here it goes. Oh. 
while I was busy, and the reason that I slightly lost my train of thought there was that Brent went racing past up a cheetah cut line. So I think for now, let's send you onto the back of his vehicle and I will continue on in search of more wonderful, hopefully woman-themed things. So it looks like Eugenius has been doing some genius things uh, as we are testing how far we can get in Wendy and it seems like we're in areas that there was no signal in before so hooray for Eugene. I did hear a report uh, Jamie was following lion tracks this morning and those lions have been found. There are, there are three Birmingham males just down off to my east in a Torchwood at First Rock. So unfortunately we will not be seeing them. But for every uh, animal that comes off, there's got to be one that comes in at some point. Oh, Johnny, look how pretty that is. It's just some really pretty clouds there, light coming through. Now, very fluffy clouds, almost look like marshmallows, or, sorry, cotton candy, probably a better description. And I wonder who can tell me what type of clouds those are. Who out there knows their clouds? And if you know what type of cloud it is, it, those are still small, still building. Uh, if you know what type of clouds those are, you can pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And if you know what type of clouds those are, let me know. See out there, who out there is budding meteorologists? Go a little bit to the left from there. There's a bigger one slightly. I'll leave the car for you from there. And you can see, there we go. That one's been started to build a little bit more. We can't see all the cloud behind us, but you can see it's starting to reach up. And when this particular type of cloud does that, it's called anviling and it forms the shape of an anvil often up top, and you can see that those clouds reaching into the sky. Now, that is a, a little one, and you get massive versions of that, and even the big Boeing commercial jetliners will fly around those clouds. Uh, the, wing fo uh, the wind force inside some of those big anvils of a cloud I nearly gave away the answer to the question to, uh, at the, wing, the winds inside, they are able to literally uh, rip the wings off a jumbo jet. And there we go, a little bit of meteorology for the afternoon. And we're quite lucky. It's still really hot, but we just seem to be hiding behind the clouds every now and then. drought conditions, the bark beetle will kill thousands of pine trees. I'm wondering if we do have a similar problem here in Africa. Well, it actually generally happens the inverse in Africa. When we have lots of good rain, uh, there are certain insect species that can uh, really do some damage to even commercial uh, trees, uh, tree plantations like pines and, and, and eucalypt eucalyptuses. Uh, and that's uh, a caterpillar called the bagworm. It literally can strip through. But in these droughts, our, our insects actually almost disappear. Now, it could be the fact that I think, oh, Arizona is also a very arid in part of the world, but maybe that specific beetle is just specialized in getting nutrients or, or water out of those pine trees. But I don't know of any insect offhand that does that while we're here. So, 
Nick, Elise, Gilly, and Elena, you only get 50% for the cloud quiz. Uh, you've got half of it right, half of it wrong. Uh, you said a cumulonim cumulonimbus. If you just think to cumulus, oh, plate visit, he's going fast, though, Jean Ray. He stopped there. Now we're in a test, Jean Andre. He's in that little pile of wood. So it looked like a bushveld planted lizard. Really fast. Really, really fast lizard species. And it's very difficult to catch them on camera. Unlike their slow moving cousin, the giant planted lizard. Oh, there's a hole. You sneaky devil. Uh, there's a hole he went down. I was hoping he was just lying under there, hiding. Uh, alas. But it looks like this is a regularly used part of the world for him. I'm just going to move the vehicle so you can have a look at the tracks. But back to the cumulus clouds. So as I was saying, if you had just said cumulus, you would have been correct. Now, cumulus nimbus. Only when cumulus clouds are producing rain. Nimbus actually means rain. So until they produce rain, they're just cumulus clouds. Uh, there were, well, as I got out to try and find that very fast lizard, I noticed that there were, even though I've driven over them, quite a few sets of his tracks here. There's one there. You can see how he's dragged his tail. And just off to the left, there's another one. So there we go. And there's my footprint there. You can see my shoe mark there. So obviously, this hole is used quite often by that bush felt plated lizard. Now, I mentioned the cousin, the giant plated lizard. And he's not so shy and retiring uh, as the bushveld plated lizard. And they have a very interesting symbiotic relationship with a dwarf mongoose. And we're going to chat about that a little bit while we move along. So, of course, dwarf mongoose live in multiple different den sites in old termite mounds. And they move around between those different sites. And in some cases, the giant plated lizards will stay either in one or maybe sometimes even move to the others as the mongoose move through. And a lot of you will remember just as I went on leave last time, I actually stayed on Juma. I had uh, friends on honeymoon who were staying in the lodge, so I drove them around on safari. And while we were doing that, I managed to catch a picture I've been wanting to catch for a very long time. Uh, and that is of a dwarf mongoose with his den mate. So those plated lizards actually feed off the mongoose's feces. So helping the mongoose keep their dens nice and clean and, and will even sometimes feed off different parasites and stuff in that, in that den. So keeping it very, very, very clean, uh, but very cool. But it's very seldom you ever see them together. You often see them separately. Where was the hold it, Chandra? How's that? Oops, there. And this, for me, is the next one. That's my favorite. It almost looks like the lizard is giving the mongoose a kiss. So I have seen them before when I didn't have my camera at close reach. Actually, almost try, almost steal food sometimes out of the mongooses. But in general, it's a very hum, harmonious little relationship they have around those dens. But it's very seldom you'll actually see them both together. So I was very excited about being able to get that photograph. <laughs> Just, I just mentioned uh, that my friends who are on their sort of family moon at Juma and uh, Luke is sitting back in New York and he's uh, said, how's it brew? So he's picked up a few South Africanisms. It also helps that his wife is South African. 
And, oh, looks like we're going to start a bit of rutting going on here. But Luke says, uh, uh, thanks for the safari. And now he's addicted to Safari Live as well. And um, I still owe him wild dogs. And I must get on with finding wild dogs. I hope we do find some uh, on this safari, Luke. Uh, nice to hear from you too, Bru. So I just saw a little bit, a bit of a heavier indicating that these impalas start, might start rutting. Uh, that means the males are going to start chasing each other around, starting to try to corral little groups of females before mating starts in earnest. And it might be the rut might be a little bit late this year with uh, the drought. It hasn't by now. Normally it should have started, but normally it really gets into full swing at the end of the month uh, and the big. What are we now? March or April? Yes. March, yes. So end of March, beginning of April. Sorry, when you live out in the bush, you tend to lose track of days, months, years, those type of things. And come on to the left, see that male rubbing his pre orbital gland. So you can see that male there rubbing his pre orbital glands up against that little terminalia there. So his hormones might be starting to get up. Uh, there are quite a few males in this herd, so maybe not quite yet ready for the full rut. Uh, there's a little bit of male following female, but not quite yet. I was hoping uh, to have some of that spectacular strange noises and parlor make during the rut and a lot of first time safari goes if they're not in the presence of their guide when they're here that almost the roar of a male in parlor think that the lions are on their way at high speed and i'm quite often shocked to find out that it is the impala making all that noise My little impala lies. So we're traversing along at the eastern boundary of Juma, heading towards the Buffalo's Hook boundary. Unfortunately, haven't found any. Oh, we're quickly across to Jamie, who has found something big and scary. My heart is pounding so fast, and I'm sure Dave's is as well. We came straight around the corner, face to face with one of the Birmingham boys. <laughs> and he was on the move, he was right at my door. We both got such a fright, shame boy. Sorry. It was just a blind corner, he came straight out of the bush into us. Here he's walking along there. That was a surprise. He's running. Just let him relax a bit. There he goes. It's interesting. That's an odd reaction from one of the Birmingham boys. They're usually very comfortable around cars. I think he just got a bit of a fright, as I did as well. Sort of a surprise coming around the corner eye to eye with a lion. So there's this male lion that we've been searching for. Now, it's very thick bush here, and I'm going to try and stay with him. It's going to be quite noisy, so bear with me. I also want to give him as much personal space as possible. Whilst trying not to lose him. If it is not a Birmingham boy, that was my automatic assumption. If it's not, it could actually be another young lion. And that would explain his more nervous reaction to the vehicle. As we carry on here, if you don't mind, I'm going to send you back over to Brent just so that I can go through here and relocate him for you. But what a nice surprise. Well, isn't that really exciting? A random Birmingham boy making an appearance. Not quite what we're looking for for International Women's Day. So maybe he can pretend to be a lady for the day. But we're going to now meander towards the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. 
I believe there is still some water there, so quite exciting. Uh, I only just, the last day before I left, I saw a bit of water there. But we do have a, scun a stunning, stunning sky. I'm just gonna edge past these trees, looking out towards the Drakensberg. Isn't that beautiful? Something just crossed the road. What was that? Ah, it was a kudu. And then Jandre focusing on the golden light that's pouring through that cloud at the moment. Escaping is probably a better word. It looks like it's escaping from that magnificent cloud. We're going to see what's happening at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Maybe there's something big and scary there. Station, this is a very brief visual of Dorengala, highly mobile, south from Pangolin. It's like a line road to the down. refer to the Birmingham boys quite often and Mike in sunny Florida who does get as hot as what we're experiencing at the moment uh, would like to know how they got their name so Mike quite recently they're from a reserve to the north of us called the Timbervati uh, and actually most of the farms in this area have very different names to what you will know them as so for example Juma is actually Western Gauri is the name, oh, elephant, is the name actually on the map, if you had to those maps, oh, no. they're not very nice. Oh, quickly back to Jamie with the lion. Here we go, we're just going to come around the corner nice and slowly. He's relaxed again, a little bit. I don't know, very dark mane. I'm going to give him plenty of space. He's got a very dark mane for the Birmingham boys. They seem to be a bit blonder. Who could this be? Could we be looking at one of the Salati males? It's possible. Or it's one of the Birmingham boys. I just didn't... It's been a long time since I've seen them. But I don't remember them having such dark manes. And he's running. Now, what's he found? What's he found? Run forward, he stopped and ducked his head in. I'm just going to get hold of Brent in the Game Drive channel. I think he caught a warthog or he heard a warthog. I'm not going closer because he's not relaxed. Standing by. Look at him looking at us. Whatever it was, I think he missed it. You'd like to stand by. To the southeast of the Moor Hutch units, in case you lose them. Brent, if you can come along to the junction of Nyala Road, South Batalia area. He went down in there after something. Oh, there we go. He's settling a little bit. Let's just watch his body language very carefully. We're just going to sit from about 100 metres away. I just want to sit quietly here and see what he's doing. He gave me such a surprise. It just goes to show that you never know what's around the next corner. I certainly didn't expect him. If it's not a Birmingham boy, look at all that mane down in the middle of his chest. What is he after in there? Probably a warthog. Digging right down. He's not physically digging, but he's trying to hit, stick his head down into a hole. Look at him looking at us. 
Who do you think this is, everybody? Our long-term viewers who know our cats as well as we do. Let us try and work out. Astralina thinks it could be Blondie. He is large. Now that he's relaxed a bit with our presence and he's got something to focus on, I'm gonna shuffle forward. Any sign of distress from him, or just even a backward glance over his shoulder, and I'm gonna stop. Oh, there's something very smelly there. Oh, you smell that, Dave? Yeah. I thought I was imagining it earlier when I came down Twin Dams. Oh, my goodness, he's found something. It stinks. There we go. I wonder if he's not found something that a hyena has put down there. Look, now he's physically digging. It's been so long since I've seen the Birmingham boys. Could it be a... Could it be a warthog? Could it be that artvark that James found? It's a, bit, it's a bit in the wrong direction from where the drag mark went this morning. Hello, boy. Who are you? Look at the way he's looking at us. It just doesn't quite feel like a Birmingham boy. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe it was just the sudden surprise on both of our parts that's got him so skittish. What's he got? Mm. There's definitely something dead down there and I think he smelt it. I'm keeping my voice down, I'm just whispering. I'm speaking quietly. I don't want to disturb him in any way. Sure. Now that he's been digging, we can smell it really clearly. Whatever it is, he's gonna pull something out of there. I think he might have got it already. Look how he's pulling. Our beard. I thought about that. There's a possibility he's trying to get at a warthog. And the thing is, from the smell that's coming from there, whatever he's trying to get at is already dead. Unless there's something else dead around here, of course, which is also a possibility. He could well. Our beard, absolutely, it could be a warthog. Oh, goodness. But there is something dead around here, and that's what's attracted him. That's why he was on such a mission. The wind was blowing perfectly from where we are now to where we first saw him. He walked in a straight line here. Okay, let's gauge again. Slow creeping movements. Let's see how he looks at us. Slowly, slowly. He's just getting up to dig more. He's not getting up because of us. Okay, he's a lot more relaxed now. We should be able to get an ID on him and find out what he's after. This is incredible. You just never know. How much of a surprise was that, Dave? We had no idea there was a line in that area. Stop here again. He stopped moving. Let's see what he's after. Just in case it isn't one of the Birmingham boys, it most likely it is. I can hear him crunching. His teeth are scraping on something. He's found a carcass of sorts. If it were a live warthog, he'd be pulling, I'm sure he would have pulled it out by now. Or it would be trying to escape more. He's caught it. Oh, no, that's definitely whatever he's got there is dead. And there 
is one other possibility. And that is that we've reached the end of our, we have. Guys, it's the end of our, there we go. He's got it. Warthog. There you go. That's what he was after. Very sad to see. I don't think he killed it there, though. I'm not entirely sure, but the smell of decay suggests to me that it was already dead. He set out. There wasn't much of a struggle. He was just trying to dig it out. Incredible. The way this afternoon has gone. One more shuffle forward. Let's see how we do. Since he has moved into the bushes. Let's have a look at him while I contact Brent on the Game Drive channel. Brent, he's now static off just east of Twin Dams, just to the north of Spaghetti Junction. He's pulled a warthog out of a hole. Copy, thanks. Uh, I can see the best thing to along the road. <coughs> That's affirmative. Best view of him, but it's a Birmingham boy. I'm fairly certain it's a Birmingham boy. He was just behaving strangely because of the surprise that occurred when we came around the corner. It's one of those rare things that doesn't often happen out here. But you do occasionally come across an animal. There's Brent, I can hear him. That's affirmative, Quibus. You're more than welcome to join us. Quibus, at the moment, visual's about two out of five. He's a bit skittish, so come slowly when you do. again. Our beard has got another theory as we sneak up on this lion, and that is maybe it was injured by the lion beforehand and had gone underground and died. It's a possibility he pounced in there so fast uh, that's a definitely a Birmingham boy. Hello, boy. Where on earth have you been hiding this whole time? That's our beard. It's a possibility, but I think he was attracted by the smell and he jumped in there and then had to drag it out. I have to be completely honest, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that it is a, there's a strong possibility that it's the female we've been seeing. And the reason that she doesn't look as thin as she was looking is because the carcass has been decaying over time. And it started to bloat. A lot of, I think a lot of you have come to the same conclusion. So we do have most likely a sad story, a sad ending to that particular story. Sure. Unfortunately, it is the one that we were expecting. 
The tusks look right, from what I know of that female. I think that it was her. And I, he was attracted by the smell. I did smell something as we drove up Twin Dams earlier, but it wasn't as pungent as it is now. You can see with him pulling the carcass out, it released it. It started at her head. Very, very sad to see. At least her suffering is now over. I was really holding thumbs for her. I hoped that she would survive. Leon, I think in this case, if we're correct about our theory, Leon was wondering, is it starvation due to the drought? If we're correct about our theory about that it is the particular warthog female we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, there was something more at play than just the drought. And I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it was some kind of disease that she'd succumbed to. Maybe she'd eaten the wrong thing, which is also a possibility that I hadn't considered up until now. Eaten something toxic that slowly caused her to waste away. It could have been a growth. Whatever it was, she was really in terrible condition. She was incredibly thin compared to her two youngsters that she was raising. No sign of them at present. Look like he's going about this meal with relish. Leon, you might even find that the disease that got her was as a result of the drought because she was eating something that she shouldn't have eaten, or just she lost a little bit of condition due to lack of nutritious food, and that caused the inactive TB within her system to start becoming active. That does commonly happen in drought seasons. Whatever it was, at least her suffering is now done. He's actually pulled her tail off in the process of pulling her out of the hole. And I think that's why he was on such a mission. He wasn't actually really running from us. He was just following a smell that he knew meant food. I wonder where on earth he came from. Where has he been hiding? He must be the male that James saw the tracks of this morning on Balanites. This is definitely... Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is almost certainly a Birmingham. One of the five Birmingham males that we discussed earlier. Interesting, if it is Blondie, and I think you are probably correcting that because he's always been the largest of the Birmingham boys. He's starting to develop his mane right down the center of his chest and on his elbows. So much larger than the last time I saw him, which was admittedly months ago. I'm really excited. This is awesome. Oh, Brent has made his way into the sighting as well, and he's on the other side of the bush. Let's find out what it looks like from his angle. So isn't this incredible? Uh, we just thought we might be able to get a slightly different angle from the other side of the thicket. And it almost looks like that water meat's a bit green. So maybe a victim of the drought. I'm not sure. I know you guys, while I've been away, have been seeing a very skinny warthog female uh, in this area. So is it, it, she might have possibly expired in her, in her burrow and he just sniffed her out. Look at that. Uh, trying to have a look whether it's a male or female from the warts on the side of the face. But I definitely think it's possibly that female. She was looking in really bad condition. And this is another reason why this drought is a time of plenty for the predators. Not only is it easier to catch animals, uh, animals expire all on their own. So there's lots of free meals around. So 
if you're watching as that male licks away there, Christopher in Arizona is wondering why do lions lick their prey before eating it? Now, Christopher, the other thing you must remember, if you've got a cat at home, how rough their tongue is. Now, imagine a lion's tongue. Uh, if he had to lick human skin constantly for a few or even three or four times in the same place, uh, he would actually take your skin right off. Now, with a warthog, there's not too much hair, so it's not to do with the hair. So they'll lick that skin and clean it off, and then you can see there now he turns his head, he uses his premolars, which basically work like a big pair of side cutters to cut through the skin of an animal. And there he's licking where he's already opened up. So it could be the taste, there could be a bit of blood there, could be removing maggots. So I think Jamie's got the best view. So we're gonna hop back on with Jamie and we're gonna go see what else we can find out there. We might have the best view, but we certainly don't have the best smell, do we, Dave? It's um, a little bit stinky here. This is the only really nice, clear visual of this lion. And the wind is blowing straight towards us. And Dave, you, you've been witness to a few kills over the, t over the last few days. What Dave hasn't yet experienced is what happens when a carcass is slightly rotten and the stomach cavity is opened. So, Dave, that pleasure still awaits you. If you think it's bad now, it's nothing to what is coming. <laughs> Dave's looking thrilled with the prospect. Really, really, I can't believe how things change like this so rapidly. It was just the last thing I expected. And I must say, with, with the excitement of a sighting like this, I'm really quite unhappy that it happened to be this female warthog, and I think it is. I was definitely rooting. Sorry, just Brent talking to me at the same time. But yes, I'm sad that it was, sorry, I was just listening to the Game Drive channel. I'm sad that it was this particular female. I really wanted her to survive. Cindy, I'm sure you're asking what is on most people's minds, and that is wonder what happened to the piglets. I honestly don't know. I don't think they would have stayed in the burrow with their dead mother, but it is possible. Sometimes youngsters do do that, young mammals. Their bond to their mother is incredibly strong in those initial stages. They have been known to stick around, but I would imagine she's been dead for about a day. There's a chance that they are still in the burrow that he dug her out from. I don't think so, though. I think they probably would have moved on. I spoke about this a couple of days ago and the fact that at least her youngsters are on solid food. So even though they would still have been suckling, they have started eating solid food. Now, there's a possibility that they will survive. Unfortunately, their chances have just got a great deal slimmer. Either way, at least her carcass is not going to waste. Look at that look. <laughs> he looked at Dave and gave a huff and turned back to his meal. Dave wasn't even moving. He just decided. He disagrees with you, Dave. Mm. <laughs> Lane's got a very interesting question, and that is, if the smell was so strong, why weren't there vultures in the area? And I think of maybe another point to that is why weren't the hyenas in the area? Why haven't the hyenas found it yet? And my answer to you, Elaine, is that it's been, as I said, she's probably been dead about a uh, few gets. Let's go back to him for a second. He's trying to move her around. 
going right into the bush. It cannot be comfortable. Where are you dragging her to? We're going to the other side now, to where Brent was. Yes, that's exactly what he's doing. Obviously decided he's uncomfortable, there's twigs all around him, there's sticks all around him, and that he just doesn't really want to... Mm. I think he might have just burst the stomach cavity. The nice news for us is that on that side, it's upwind. Let me just mobilise. The, the question from Elaine about why the vultures haven't found it. Our world, our vultures in this particular area search by sight, not by sense of smell. There are vultures in other parts of the world that locate kills by smell. It's not the case with our vultures. Let me just see if there's a nice way around. There's a nice way around. Owls look by sight, so they've got incredible binocular vision that allows them to locate carcasses, even the size of an art farm. Let's see, just see where he's going to go. So they haven't spotted her because she was underground. We are going to have to, sorry, we're going to have to go all the way around to get to him. Otherwise, we're just going to disturb him if we go crashing through there, and we'll end up the only clear path is a little bit too close to him. It gives me a chance to answer Elaine's question properly. So, the vultures won't have been able to see him since our vultures are attracted by sight and want. As soon as one vulture spots something and starts to descend, the other vultures thermally are also keeping an eye not just on the ground but at what other vultures are doing. And as soon as they spot that, they start to duck down. There's also a lot of vultures are attracted by the presence of other birds of prey, like tawny eagles and bataliers, that scour on a much lower level and so are the first, often the first, to spot a carcass. And when vultures see them, they'll go and investigate whatever it is they've happened to spot. Find a nice clear way in here. I think that the hyenas haven't found him because it's been so hot. They haven't found her is because it's been so hot. She's been rotting. That's why the smell is as strong as it is. Squeeze in here. But the hyenas haven't been active. They've been too hot. They've been lying up in pans and puddles or at the den site or somewhere in the shade. And they haven't actually been actively searching. Now, they probably would have got here at some point tonight and dug the water gut. Okay. He's found a much nicer place to start feeding on his rather grisly meal. I think he was just uncomfortable there. There were twigs poking him where he was lying. And even he's showing a little bit of reluctance to eat around the abdomen. He started with the ears and the face, licking as Brent was describing, getting rid of the fur. And using those spurs on his tongue little bits of meat off. I know that that was, I actually should have addressed this earlier. I knew that there was going to be an immediate concern and I forgot to mention it. So if the warthog was ill, a lot of you, Wendy included, but many of you are worried about the lion then eating her and catching whatever it is she had. And there's a couple of things to mention here. First of all, a lot of the animals here are carriers of TB, but they are almost in essence immune to it, if that is what actually killed her in the end. So he might be carrying it, but it is an inactive, inactive form. So unless he loses condition, which point the TB might kick in anyway. He's not going to catch any disease that he wouldn't already possibly have. There's another aspect to it. If it was a bacterial infection, as soon as a, a carcass like this starts to decompose, and the same goes for anthrax and a lot of the bacterial infections, once it starts to decompose, the natural decomposition bacteria actually outcompete 
the bacteria that caused the disease in the first place and kill them off within hours of the carcass starting to decompose. And for those of you that are sensitive, this is a bit of a grisly view. Just be aware, not the most pleasant thing to witness. All part of nature. Though he won't be catching any diseases. I've spoke, uh, or Brent I think has actually mentioned that there have been sightings with rabies or animals that have died of rabies and animals have actually shown fear when faced with an animal infected with rabies and moved away from it. I don't think it was rabies that had her, though her behavior was, that she had, her behavior was totally wrong. Wasn't at all what she was experiencing. And if it is a toxin, just to cover the final base, if it was a toxin, the chances of him getting or transmitting through in ingestion or through him eating her is next to nothing. These animals are such consummate survivors. For every diseased warthog that we might see a lion eat, he's eaten plenty worse in his time. Ultimately, nature knows, for the most part, what is good for them. I'm not, I'm not in any way concerned he's going to catch anything from this female. Except maybe a cut on his paw from where he's holding it. He does look very chuffed with himself now. I wonder where on earth he was hiding. After two days flat of searching for lions and we just happened to bump into him. The other three Birmingham boys that we know of or are on First Rock on Torchwood, which is to our eastern boundary. Steph, who's watching in Belgium, was wondering how far away they actually are. The answer is, I'm not that far. I've been to First Rock once or twice before. I'm going to give you a rough estimate of about three or so odd kilometers. So just under one and a half miles, for those of you who work in imperial systems. As for where the fifth Birmingham boy is, I don't have an answer to that. I'm not entirely sure. I don't, I don't think he's been reported by any of the other guys in the area, which is not that uncommon for male lions that have then have established themselves a territory. They often go off in their separate ways and then return to each other. They'll go and patrol on their own Maybe even, it could even be that the other male is mating with the Inkahumas wherever they happen to be hiding. James did find tracks of a male and a female this morning. And that is also a possibility. You can see already where his tongue is stripped away at her fur. I wonder, I wonder if she didn't have some com some form of growth. That's also a possibility. Definitely not. Definitely not healthy pink flesh of an animal that's been recently killed. Now using his carnassial teeth at the back of his mouth and slicing through. Uh, it's a little bit too early, I think, to be seeing any maggots at this distance. But Lael was wondering how fast maggots will appear on a carcass after, after death. And Lael, it's actually the most incredible science that is behind this. And I know a lot of forensic investigators have done experiments, in, experiments into the development of maggots at different temperatures. Now on a hot day like today, where temperatures nearly reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so 38, 39 centigrade, 
And they, like today, in the last few days, they would develop incredibly rapidly. So we would already be seeing newly hatched maggots within a, at least 24 hours, if not a shorter period of time. They'd be very, very tiny. And the rate that they grow at is then also determined by temperature. I would say that she probably already had maggots around her when he found her. It's just that at this distance, we can't see them. Not that I think we have any desire to be right up close. He's not really approaching her with relish. He actually doesn't seem, he seems very reluctant to open the stomach contents. We know when lions have a fresh kill that they have just taken down, they almost immediately open up the stomach <clears throat> and they go for the most nutritious organs, the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, the heart. That is where they focus their attention and that's actually what they fight over for when they first make a kill. The storm is coming, you can hear the wind blowing, so can he. Look at his mane, he looks like a shampoo advert or a hair gel advert blowing in the wind. I'm thrilled to hear that. I didn't get to, I didn't get to my Women's Day tribute at the hyenas den, but for Linda, this was the animal that she wanted to see. Uh, Linda, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm glad that we could provide it. We did ask viewers which particular animals they wanted to see while we were on International Women's Day or special wish lists, and. I have to I have to be honest, Linda, if you'd mentioned that to me or if that had come through to me at the beginning of the drive, I might have said, well, Linda, I'm going to try incredibly hard, but I'm not sure. I don't know if there are any of them on the property. He just appeared out of nowhere. He really did. Just goes to show that even on the hottest day, when most of the time lions are sleeping, if they want to move, they will move. They don't always do what the textbooks predict that they will do. And moving through at the time of day that he did, generally the Birmingham boys have shown themselves to be, I wouldn't say not lazy individuals. Oh, he's up again. Looking for leverage. Generally they've shown a reluctance at night to stir themselves before the later hours. They don't seem to enjoy, most lions don't enjoy the heat. But I think he's actually, he's quite hungry. It's in a fairly empty belly. Not starving, fairly peckish. Not peckish enough, however, to go about eating this warthog carcass with relish. I wouldn't even be surprised if he actually leaves her. Let's see. What's that, boy? Is it not quite to your tastes? We have an expression in South Africa when somebody is eating in a way that, and it's actually highly appropriate for this particular sighting, when somebody is eating reluctantly, when they clearly don't have any appetite but they're trying to force themselves to eat. In Afrikaans you say, say eat mit lang tana, which means they're eating with long, or she's eating or he's eating with long teeth. In this case, a perfectly apt description, since he certainly has longer teeth than any people I know. Very appropriate. I didn't get to my hyena den, but that doesn't mean that the hyenas are not going to make an appearance at some point. They will be attracted to the smell, and with the wind blowing in the way that it is, we'll carry it far and wide and alert them. And Debbie was wondering if they do make an appearance, if they do discover this carcass, will they attempt to drive this lion off the carcass? Debbie, not with a male lion, no. Not unless they are in huge numbers and desperate enough 
to attempt it. So with female lions, so with lionesses, hyenas are much braver, but even then, has to be in numbers of at least five or six again per lioness before they even start to think about tackling them. So a lone lioness on her own could, could think about holding off five or six. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but in Kahuma Pride, you'd need at least 10 hyenas to chase them off a kill. As soon as you add a male into the equation, hyenas become a lot more reluctant to interfere. And I've seen males, I've seen a male kill a hyena before. So they tend to respond very aggressively. And they're just much larger. At over 100 kilograms more than a female, if a hyena weighs 60 odd kilograms, 60 to 80 odd kilograms, which is 120 to 160 odd pounds, a male lion is easily 200, 230 is over 400, close to 500 pounds. They're not going to ch decide to tackle him. It's not worth the risk. And at this time, in this, in this moment of opportunity, they have had so much to eat. They are not struggling at all for access to food. It's really not worth the risk. And you see it, you don't see as much hyena lion interaction in this particular area as you will for example, in a more arid zone where there's far less food, let's transport ourselves to Botswana for a second, where for hyena, access to food is far more limited. And so if they do find lions on a carcass, it's slightly more worth the risk in tackling them and attempting to scare them off. And there, of course, the clan sizes are much, much larger than they are here. Probably what you'll find if a hyena does decide to rock up, you're going to be on the outskirts at 50 odd meters, even more away, just watching. And he'll slink about, he or she will slink about and have a jolly good look at what's going on, but that will be about as far as it goes. He very determinedly turned his back on us. And I think that so far, Gracie's come up with the best explanation as to the death of our warthog. And Gracie has decided that since, or has suggested that since this warthog has done such a good job with her own babies, Gracie says maybe that maybe God decided that she was such a good mom that he needed her up in heaven to be a mom for the piglet that Tingana killed over Big Cat Week. And I like to think, Gracie, that wherever this warthog mommy is, she's looking after the whole array of little piglets up there as well, and I'm sure that she would. And I think that's the explanation that we will stick with. But at least her death is not wasted because the lion gets to have a meal. Albeit reluctantly. Such a surprise. I still can't get over the surprise. I've mentioned that I've noticed, for me, having not seen this particular lion in a while, the, the amount of growth that he has experienced is 
much more than I expected. He's got main, his mane is starting to extend all the way down his back. He no longer has that teenage look. Even though Blondie was always the largest, he no longer has a teenage look. He's getting that dark, those, that darkness to it. He's also developed the elbow patches in a much more obvious way. Not as clear now that he's sitting on them. Genevieve was wondering, in a drought, would that affect a lion's testosterone levels? I guess to an extent, but not in a, not in a straight out effect. I think it would be more the fact that they have better access to food. They don't maybe have to move as far or exert as much energy in order to find it. And therefore, their growth can be larger. Maybe they can put more effort or they can put more resources into producing testosterone. But Genevieve, I don't think there's any direct effect. It's more to do with the increased access to resources and the lack of wastage of energy. They only really have to exert energy in terms of taking down prey. They don't have to go looking for it as they would have had to before. And we know the Birmingham boys have been killing a buffalo regularly around three in a row pan on Cheetah Plains. <clears throat> because the buffalo are forced to go there for water. That being said, I do think that there is an incredible increase or a kick up in testosterone that occurs when male lions start or initiate a pride takeover and when they are successful. And I'm sure we saw it in action with these boys. It just, the, the accelerated rate of their growth and maturity seemed to me that there must be some kind of increase of testosterone when something like that occurred. And there was also their increased level of, levels of aggression as a result. The, the death of the Inkahuma lioness being a good example of that, where they are so caught up in the process of the takeover when they were trying to chase away the Matimbas from this area and push their way in, that they ended up with a misplaced aggression aimed at her. And it took a long time for the Inkahuma females to get to the point where they could were safely mating in a peaceful, semi-peaceful situation with the Birmingham boys. It's an interesting one. There's definitely an, a peak in testosterone. I think there's an increase in testosterone <clears throat> when a pride takeover like that happens. As for the drought scenario, I don't think as much. It's just more increased growth. I am impressed, though, by the amount of growing that he's done. The Birmingham boys have always been fairly large boys. There he's up again. He's managed to open up in the neck. I am so grateful for the position that we are currently sitting in. Thank you, mister, for moving the warthog. I wondered if he wouldn't leave it. Jill and Bruce and Jimmelin, and I'm sure lots of you are a bit confused about why he decided to start tackling the face first and didn't go for the more nutritious organs that lions usually go for. Which is why I mentioned that that's the typical approach with a fresh kill. I don't think he wants to open up the stomach contents. I don't know that he thinks it's worth it. And in fact, it looks as though he's on his way. He's just decided that that's not really the meal he wants. He's not starving hungry. Sorry, move my head. He's not starving hungry. And I think that he doesn't want to open up that cavity, release the smell, and it will be putrid in there. It's just as the result of the putrefaction that's been happening. see what he decides to do. He's been very restless. I did suggest that there was a chance he was going to leave the carcass. You see that has proved to be the case. Or has he just got up to, he might have just got up to urinate. Let's just stop here for one moment before we go all the way around, because I think he might come back. Let's see what he does.
wait to see what he decides to do. Let's jump over to Brent and find out what he's been up to. So we've come right up to the northwestern corner and we're sitting adjacent to Sydney's waterhole and there's a hippo bull out of the water drinking out of the little pumped pan. So obviously he feels that water is much cleaner than the water that's left in the dam itself. And while oh, he's looking like he's got a bit of a limp there. It looks like he might come closer to us. Now, Hippo can walk up to about 30 kilometers a night to and from. So can do in excess of 60 kilometers in a night getting to grazing and back. And of course, any of the ones that are injured or old, this takes a very heavy toll on, such as this gentleman. And a uh, very interesting thing, so while I was driving out of Juma, I was actually able to go right up to Sydney's. And we can confirm there are two crocodiles in there now. So I know James thought they might have seen one. Uh, when we were there, we actually got a really nice close view of the crocodiles uh, in Sydney's waterhole, feeding on catfish. Try and move a little bit. This is a notoriously difficult spot from a signal point of view. Hopefully the gremlins are on our side on this hot windy evening. Oh, I don't think he's going to walk out of fame almost immediately. There he is. That little black spot there. In times like this, the lions are definitely would take a chance at a hippo, and if, especially if there's a pride or a couple of males around. So, Mr. Hippo, beware. Uh, speaking of lions, let's go see what that big boy is up to with Jamie. Here we go. He hasn't moved too far away at all is just off, lying just a little way away from the carcass. He got up to relieve himself. He's now lying in the African sunset. Bless you, boy. Just had a sneeze. Maybe a bit of warthog fur up the nose. All that licking he's doing is just cleaning himself after his meal. Absolutely incredible light. Now, just like your domestic cats at home, the lions get fur balls with the best of them. And in fact, given the amount of fur that they lick, and they have to lick, has attracted his attention and the incredible efficiency of those spurs on his tongue they do consume a great deal of hair and they very often cough up hairballs this is a very important part of the rituals particularly the cleaning of the pores just to make sure that there's no infection but also to keep the claw sheaths clean and free from any muck that might prevent the claws from coming out earlier that I suspected, suspected that he might have been following the smell of that warthog. And Sibu Sisu, the black mama from Hammond's Kral, 
What has he spotted? He's seen something. Sorry, Sibu Sisi, we'll be with you now. I'm not gonna move yet in case he wants to go hunting. Just keep an eye on him. I'm trying to look behind the bushes. It's a very alert posture. Head up. At the moment, he's trying to work out what's there himself. He's heard something, or he's seen something. He's just assessing it. Let's just be quiet for a moment. He's going to investigate. Though he's going to go into stalk mode. Oh, it's the lionesses. Goodness. <laughs> Hello, ladies. Where on earth have you been hiding? <laughs> this day just goes from good to better. I was hoping the ladies might make an appearance for Women's Day. In Kahuma lionesses joining the male, going to investigate his kill. Here they come now. Here we go. Now, where on earth were you ladies hiding? Stations, this Madura Ngala has just been joined by the Inkuhumas. Still same position, twin dams on the western edge, just to the north of the junction with the Mulwati around Yala Road. Oh. There's a bit of a rock there over the carcass. Let's go forward a little bit. It's amazing. He didn't want it, but he didn't want them to have it either. So they went to investigate, but video mark, you were wondering if the lionesses would have been interested in feeding on that particular carcass. And clearly the answer was, Maybe they might have wanted to have gone to have a bit of a tentative lick. And yes, they might even, depending on how hungry they are, and I haven't had a chance to look properly, they might actually have been interested in feeding on it. But he is just not going to give them the opportunity. Now the question is, do we stay with the male? Do we travel with the females? There's actually still one female with him. Let's just go back here because they're going to fight over that carcass again. She's investigating now, herself. They are hungry. They are very hungry. You can see that, that flap of skin that starts to become visible between the hind legs on a hungry lioness. And she is a hungry girl. He's not gonna let her anywhere near it. She's investigating the source of the smell to see if there's any more that she can get to. Hmm. Hmm. Carcass flavored dust. How's that suiting us, Dave? No girl. No big girl. One of those interesting things about male lions. 
They might not want to eat anymore, but they don't want anyone else to have it either. Look at the dust clouds billowing. Mmm. Tasty. This is incredible behavior to witness. How amazing is this sighting? Digging lions, warthog kill. She's looking at him desperately as if to say, can I please join you? With a small carcass like that, there's no way. And they would be interested. In answer to video Mark's question, they would be interested. Looking at how hungry they are now, they've obviously been unsuccessful in their hunting attempts recently. I don't mean that they're starving, but they are very much in the mood for a meal. The other females have moved off. Mm. Thank you, girl. I needed that face full of carcass dust. <coughs> He's still persisting. Maybe she knows something that we don't. I don't think so, though. She's just investigating. Maybe you can see that. They need... They will be hungry now. They will be on the hunt. And a night like tonight is a perfect opportunity for them. It's windy. It's going to be cloudy, so there's going to be no ambient light. And I want it to... And for International Women's Day, I think that we will be trying to stay with them for as long as possible because the ladies are going to be on the hunt. And while I catch up with them and find out what they're up to, Let's jump over onto Brent's vehicle. He is at the hyena den in my place. So no International Women's Day would be complete without a trip to the only truly matriarchal society in the African bush, the one that's run by the ladies. So we're at the spotted hyena clan. There are 11 different hyenas around, incredibly active. And they do. The ladies have taken on uh, evening attire, and you can see they're very dark black, and, uh, and it's their evening dress. They've spent their day preparing in the spa, i.e. a mud wallow to keep cool before heading out on their nocturnal activities. And here we got one of the little guys. It's amazing. They're getting more curious and more curious every single day. And, of course, the hyenas have moved dens while I've been gone to a den they have utilised before. And, obviously, the fleas and ticks got too bad at the last one. So the light is disappearing really, really quickly. But we have this wonderfully strong breezy wind uh, the sun has actually disappeared behind a large storm cloud so it's giving us a little bit less time than we would have liked of course our cameras make it look a lot lighter than it really is but let's have one last little look at these little guys and i've just heard uh, over that the radio in my ear that jamie is quite convinced that the lionesses look hungry and are going to hunt and in this uh, really bustling wind I think it's a good chance so we're gonna leave the hyenas to carry on with their nocturnal activities and we're gonna have some nocturnal activity of our own and I'm gonna send you across to Jamie I'm also gonna make my way towards Jamie so we can have two vehicles with those lions while they hunt moment they're coming for a drink I know that I've said Brent, but there's the possibility of them coming to hunt. Here's one walking towards us. And there's one drinking. I'm just going to duck my head down. This has been an incredible sighting. I'm just going to rest my spotlight on, on the door. So you don't get the shakes coming through. Look at the reflections of the water. This is 
On International Women's Day. One, two, three, four of them. So I think that our theories are correct. I think that one of them is mating with a Birmingham boy. And that is where the other Birmingham male is. And that's why our gentleman is all on his own. Because not everybody gets to have a chance. How oh, amazing is this? I suspect, given how hungry they look, I strongly suspect that tonight is going to be a hunting night and that they're going to be up and about from now. I think we'll stay with them for as long as possible, depending on where they decide to go. To see four fearsome female hunters is a really nice end to International Women's Day. Especially of what, given that most of us know the backstory to this pride and all that they've been through over the last few months. See them coming through united and strong and healthy looking after the experiences that they've shared is very special. And Annie, I hope you're still watching and you were asking about female animals with male traits and it's difficult in terms of listing male traits but Lionesses are famed for their hunting ability. Perhaps this is quite a good example. Before my day went completely contrary to how I was expecting it to go, I was going to talk to you all about termites and praying mantises and fully answer your question, Annie. But things have just changed a little bit. Look how alert they look. With the ripples of the water. I don't think she's quite done yet, but everybody's left the party, so she's going to have to be. Right. I'm going to change the angle of my side lights. And let's go on the hunt with the ladies. Oh. When we do follow animals like this on a hunt at night, if we see at any point that they've spotted or if we spot a potential prey animal, we immediately switch off all of our lights. The reason we do that is because, first of all, the spotlights, if left on a general game animal, will actually detract or take away from their night vision. We don't want to interfere in any way. We don't want to illuminate the lions and give their position away. Should we take the spotlight out? It looks nice like this to me. Now, this is the stride I was talking about when I speak about when their tracks register. That's the exact speed I meant. Here we go. I was really hoping that they weren't gonna go in this way. We'll try and stay with them as long as possible. I just wanna get a whole update for the guys on the Game Guide channel. Stations is for Mufazi and Gala are now mobile northwest along Twin Dams. I've left the Nona Ngala still in the same position with his bumper. This is 
an incredibly difficult drainage line to traverse. And you're going to have to go around towards the road to do so. interesting update from our much beloved Steph. Steph has just said he's got, he's heard lions roaring on quarantine, and so he's gone to fetch a spotlight to investigate. It could be the other male. <whistles> you know, James Henry's also sent a tweet with that information. This evening is turning out to be incredibly interesting. It's probably the other Nkuhuma lioness with one of the Birmingham boys. Shall we see if they've spotted something? She's listening. It's going to be her decision. I think probably what will happen is that Brent will go and investigate. <laughs> Steph. When Brent can go and sit with those lions, we can stay with our ladies. It's quarantine, to be completely honest. I'm going to go and meet up with that other lioness. They're hearing things that we can't hear at our distance. Okay, the sub-adult, I can see her second from the front there as we, ca as we move along. She's looking very... She's a hungry girl. Still not in any danger. They're not hungry enough that they're faced with starvation or anything like that. Just they needed a good meal. And as soon as I can, <clears throat> I'll try and loop ahead of them. Although this is a pretty spectacular view. What an awesome way for the day to have gone. When he went to investigate something, the last thing I expected was to see four lionesses just popping up out of nowhere. This is one of the aspects that I absolutely love about the bush unpredictable. She's there. I just had to stop for a second. There was a lioness right here, so I'm move on top of her. I wish, I wish I could get into their minds for a moment and discover exactly where they've been hiding for the last few days since they left Bucklesford Dam with James. Where have you been, ladies? to make a decision there. Laura was wondering where the male has gone. He might be behind me. He might be following behind me. He might be making his way straight towards quarantine. But I had to decide who I wanted to stay with. And in that moment, I decided I wanted to stay with the females because they are looking as though they might be on the hunt. So I left him with the, with the warthog standing by. Brent's just... Negative. Steph's just heard animals vocalizing on quarantine. She's going into crouch mode. Let's just see what this lioness in front of us does. I'm 
sorry to take your lights away. They are, they've spotted something. Completely frozen in time. Let's just sit and listen and watch for a moment. We can't turn our lights on at this stage. No. We'll hear as soon as something happens, or if the line is that I can still see in front of me if she decides to carry on walking. I can see their eyes reflecting that. I don't think that they've been successful. There's two of them that I can see. I think they've just stopped for a rest, to be honest. Yeah, there's a little bit of a friction there. They don't do head rubbing when they're hunting something. This is not the direction I expected them to go in. It does take us right into the Mulwati drainage line. It's a little tricky for us to follow. They might just be cutting the corner of the road, but I don't want to risk it by going around and using them. go through here. We're going to have to go around. Very tricky to drive through in the night after lions. You run the risk of doing serious damage to the car, which obviously we don't want to risk. I suspect, I have a sneaky suspicion, they're going straight towards the dam. Some of you have realized that there are lions at the dam camera. That is why I suspect that these lions are on their way there. Brent is racing to the Juma Dam, so don't panic. He's going there. I'm going to stay with these lionesses in theory. Although they've done a little bit of a duck, I'm sure they're going to pop I hope they're going to pop out here. It's one of the densest sections just next to the Mawati drainage. Calculations are correct. They should be coming out somewhere here. It's either that or they're going to move into the drainage line itself and walk from there. Since I've lost my lovely lionesses, let's have a look at the one that Brent has found. This is the lion that James and Steph heard roaring around the bush dinner site. She's looking for the other girls. Oh, hungry. But with this wind, the way she's calling, is the sound's being taken away from the other lionesses. who are downwind and we've got a strong wind.
So the rest of the lines are down to the south of us, and she's heading due north at the moment. So it's unlikely they're going to be able to hear her clearly through this wind. So I guess she's hoping that they call, because she will pick that up. Oh, she's roaring again. She's looking the wrong direction, so those other lines will be almost directly over her back. This is not uncommon. Don't worry. Yeah, quite soft roaring. I'm just going to move around quickly. Oh, wait. So we can try get downwind of her and get the full experience of that roar. Amber-eyed lioness. Looks like she's heard something. So what probably happened is they might have been separated in a hunt. This does happen from time to time, especially with an unsuccessful hunt. She's hoping for a reply. And you can see the little plants, how strong this wind is blowing through here. Now, don't get too worried. She will almost certainly find the rest of the pride. Uh, during the night, or if not, during the next few nights. And, and it's not that uncommon that lions get separated from their pride, various different reasons, sometimes because they're an estrus and they want to mate, or during an unsuccessful hunt. That's a bit more of a serious role. to the pride. Uh, Jamie's lost vision of those lionesses she was with. Uh, 
but if this female decides to head south down here, she's got a good chance of meeting up with them. If she goes north, uh, maybe less so early on in the evening, but maybe in the early morning, when the wind dies down, her, her, her roar will be able to carry a lion's roar. Uh, just from the human ear, it can be heard for about 10 kilometers. Uh, so that means the lions can probably hear it from a lot further away. It's very really hot, so she's probably going to do what we've seen her doing. She's going to call, sleep, call, walk. Anyway, she's walking it. Oh, she's behind the bush. So what's amazing is Jamie's not very far from here and she can't hear that because of the wind. So again, she's, as I said, she's going to walk, call, call, rest a little bit. It's still really hot. Um, oh, here we go. We're really close. Hopefully she gives us a good big roar. So guys, we're coming towards the end of the Sunset Safari and our fitting on International Women's Day. We've got a lioness showing it's not the big boys who do all the roaring. So we're going to let her meander off into the dark, calling for the rest of her pride. Hopefully for her, the wind dies down. And of course, we don't want to keep following her. Obviously, the vehicle noise will have a little bit of effect. But we're going to let her move off. Uh, can just make her out in the distance. But I really, really I hope all the women out there had an absolutely amazing Women's Day. And as I said, great to have a lioness showing us it's not only the big boys who do the roaring. So don't forget to join us for the Sunrise Safari. Hopefully the lions will be out and we can finish up to see if she finds the rest of her pride.